Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. <laughs> A fun day, Easter celebrations returning to Brackenridge Park for Easter Sunday. Yeah, it was a welcome step closer to normalcy for the hundreds of families who had to forego their Easter traditions last year when the city and county closed the parks down. Yeah, but the night team's Garrett Berncher tells us things still weren't quite the same. Tell them no more coronavirus. No more coronavirus. <laughs> that may not be the case quite yet. But with the pandemic situation looking up locally, San Antonio families were once again back at BRAC for Easter, which many have been doing for years. We've been here at the same spot, uh, you know, before they expanded and before the renovations uh, to the park. For 66 years, the Serna family has been coming to BRAC and Ridge Park for Easter. Well, 65, considering last year was a bust. You got to take that one year off. Right? <laughs> right. we, we have an asterisk. Even this year was a little off with a strangely tentless landscape. Though the city kept its parks open, it did not allow the traditional camping out through the weekend, which families typically use to stake claim to their favorite spots. Families may not have been able to camp out, but being together today, Easter Sunday, is the real meat of the tradition. And the mainstays like cookouts, candy, and cruising cars were on full display. Though the Serna said there seemed to be fewer people around this year enjoying them. I've never seen so many empty tables on a Sunday. They say even their clan had about a third of the people who'd normally be there. We're missing a whole side of our family that just, you know, had decided uh, the numbers were still too high. Though all the changes meant some others were finally able to find space to take part too. With families with, with uh, their spots, you couldn't get on. And now it's after COVID, it's first come, first serve. And Everybody's friendly, everybody's staying away from each other. But newcomers and old timers alike revel in taking part in the San Antonio tradition. You know, we like it here. Woo! <laughs> Happy Easter, All San right. Antonio. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. For the past seven years, Comal County and state officials have tried to force the operator of an illegal dump in Spring Branch to clean up his act. Despite taking him to court and having him arrested twice for failing to follow court orders, the massive mess there remains. Now the state is going after the owner of the land. We tried several times to set up an interview with him. When that didn't work, I stopped by and he wasn't happy to see me. Ed, turn the cameras off. I don't want nothing on me. Okay. okay. I, I've been trying to reach you. That includes you, sir. That's Edward Reifenberry. He eventually did agree to tell me his side of the story, and it is tonight's Defenders Investigation Update. <laughs> is it just overwhelming when you come here? It is. It really is. So it's just... It's been a nightmare. Ed Reifenberry inherited this 3.6 acre plot of land from his parents. He also inherited the mess left behind by his former tenant, William Bill Easley, who was running a plastics and metal recycling business on the land. And he was doing decent and then he, he just stopped recycling stuff and just kept taking stuff in. According to state records, easily began operating We Recycle Texas on the property in 2014. These satellite images from Google Earth show how quickly the land filled up with piles and debris. The state and everybody has kind of dropped the ball because it should have never gotten this far in the first place. While Reifenberry blames others for allowing things to get out of hand, it only took the state four months to take notice of Easley's operation. An inspection in July 2014 found Easley was not following state guidelines and he was cited for numerous violations. A second failed inspection later that year led to his recycling permit being suspended for 30 days in 2015. It was suspended again in 2016 following more violations. Can I talk to you? After that, Easley continued to operate without a permit. In 2018, the Texas Attorney General sued Easley and Reifenberry. Inspectors from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality alleged the site was filled with more than plastics and metal. They said it also contained hazardous chemicals and other harmful fluids. A judge granted the state a permanent injunction and ordered Easley to begin cleaning up the property. When he failed to comply, Easley was arrested for contempt of court twice in 2019. Now the state is coming after Reifenberry. Well, I mean, we're trying to clean it up and we've only had access on the land for like the last nine months. Reifenberry began cleaning up the property after he got easily evicted, but it's a big job for one man. It is a lot, you know, there's still an estimated about uh, 20,000 cubic yards of mess still here. Each month he's now required to show the state what he's removing from the property, sending them these pictures and receipts. 
um, we've hauled off about 60,000, I mean, six, 60 tons mm -hmm. worth of recycling. And, uh, you know, we're trying to do what we can. We get the monthly email from the attorney general's office, but there's every now and then, and I'm like, hey, man, I've got six phone calls just this week. And, you know, we, I really need something to tell them. County Commissioner Jen Crownover frustrated by the snail's pace of progress. She's been dealing with the dump since 2015 and the complaints it draws from her constituents. She's now hopeful Reifenberry will continue to make improvements. You know, the, the man has stood up and accepted responsibility. Um, he has been diligent in his reporting of progress and stuff, and while it's not enough for any of us, um, he has been accountable to that. There's not a defined ending ending time, which is which is a little frustrating. But, Spring Branch uh, Mayor James uh, it's, Mayer it's would like the state to take a more aggressive approach and, if necessary, even condemn the property. There are several options that they could they could do. All, all those would not be uh, equitable solution for the property owner, but at some point it, it needs to come come to that. To that resolution. Mayor has gone as far as finding potential investors to work with Reifenberry, and it's something he's now considering, even though it means losing the land and the more than $391,000 it's valued at. I just have to let it go, you know. So, I mean, it'll get cleaned up. Frustrating situation for everyone involved. Reifenberry said the investor he's talking to has the tools to clean up that property and could have it done in 120 days once the papers are signed. But with no timeline in place from the state and Reifenberry only able to remove materials by the trailer load, it looks like that mess will continue to be an eyesore for the time being. A couple fatal crashes leading off today's top stories. San Antonio police still trying to figure out what caused a vehicle to flip over, killing one person and putting two others in the hospital, one of which we're told was a child. This happened on Loop 410 on Somerset Road. Police say the vehicle was heading west when it somehow flipped and hit a road sign. One of the three people inside the vehicle was pronounced dead at the scene, but we're still waiting to hear which person that was. Another was airlifted to the hospital and a third was taken by ambulance. No other vehicles were involved. Another person killed after crashing into a tree this morning. This one happened at 2.30 a.m. in the 11,000 block of Applewhite. Police say the driver somehow lost control, sending them across oncoming traffic before hitting the tree. Officers say the driver was not wearing a seatbelt and was pronounced dead at the scene. A passenger was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Police say they believe the driver was speeding, which was likely factored into the crash. A family pet lost to a house fire early this morning, which also left the owners with nowhere to go. More than a dozen fire units were called out to a home in the 5900 block of Bow Spirit Street around 4 a.m. this morning. By the time they got there, firefighters say that home was fully engulfed with flames shooting through the roof, making it difficult to fight. We did have a, a, a problem uh, with the Delta exposure on the, I guess, the right side of the house, uh, but we were able to contain that and keep that at bay. Firefighters tell us the fire started in the living room and then quickly spread to the rest of the home. The family of four inside were able to get out safely, but the same cannot be said for their chihuahua. Arson investigators still looking into the cause. A project aimed at providing housing for the homeless has hit some roadblocks since its inception. In fact, Last Chance Ministries Tiny Homes Project, also known as Victorious Point Transitional Homes, is now at a standstill. At Last Chance, as Last Chance Ministries faces a series of zoning requirements brought on by the city of San Antonio. The night team's Jonathan Cotto spoke with the pastor who explained how he plans to move forward despite all these setbacks. These tiny homes have been sitting here vacant for the past two years. But now in compliance with the city's zoning requirements, Pastor Jimmy Robles with Last Chance Ministry says they're one step closer to resuming construction. We've been in communication with the city manager and now we finally got permits uh, to move forward. So we knocked down the white fence that was here before and uh, they approved 24 homes to get, get installed. But before those homes can be put in place, the city still needs specific zoning rules to be met. Things like paved access for emergency vehicles. The delay right now is finances because what they want is, uh, they want fire hydrant, sewer lines, uh, water lines. All of that, Pastor Robles says, comes with a hefty price tag. So it went from $65,000 worth of fines when I first brought them in 
to reducing everything and dismissing it all after, you know, I had to explain myself. But it's a price Robles says will be worth paying, adding February's winter storm highlighted the need for these types of homes, which are meant to help the city's homeless transition to a self-sufficiency. And I was able to tell the city, like, our tiny homes, is, it's a benefit, man. It's a lot better than being considered like a tent city like Austin or so forth. Robles now hopes he can get the support needed to meet the costs associated with the city's mandates. I'm hoping that I open the tiny homes um, by the end of the year. So our goal is to have 100 houses in this property uh, for veterans and for single families and families. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Outside with live cam tonight, hope you had a wonderful weekend. It was pretty cloudy for most of it, but overall very comfortable and uh, hopefully the rain, the light rain that we've had the past couple of mornings didn't mess up any Easter egg hunts today. Uh, looking ahead, we're going to talk about a very, very warm week in store. For now, it's 70, so still a touch on the warm side, especially at this hour. Winds are still breezy out of the east southeast, right around 14 miles per hour, and it is cloudy. So we saw some clearing late this afternoon and this evening, but those clouds are going to build back in, getting us off to a cloudy start tomorrow morning. Overall, though, tomorrow will be another pretty comfortable day. After that, we turn up the the heat. You're going to want to turn up the AC as well. It's going to be a very warm week, but we do have a glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel, a chance for some showers, maybe a few rumbles of thunder late this week. We'll talk about all that. Get you ready for the week ahead coming up in just a bit. Still ahead on the night beat, Capitol Police urging Congress to ramp up security following this week's deadly attack. This is their union says morale is nearing crisis level. Plus, learning from his own experiences, how one local man is providing for the city's homeless. We'll introduce you in this week's What's Up South Texas. And tomorrow, the Texas Rangers will allow full capacity for their home opener, upward of 40,000 fans to be in attendance. It comes as health experts continue to warn of a fourth surge and the ongoing spread of COVID-19 variants. The latest when we return. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. To the latest now on COVID, vaccinations set a one-day record this weekend. The nation now administering on average more than 3 million shots every day. Yeah, health officials are still warning Americans to avoid large gatherings and non-essential travel, but at least one baseball team is planning on allowing full capacity for opening day. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi with the details. When the Texas Rangers take the field on Monday for their home opener, they may welcome as many as 40,000 fans or more as the team allows full capacity in the stands again. The decision facing some criticism. I think it's a mistake. They should listen to Dr. Fauci and the scientists and the experts. The CDC is still warning Americans not to gather in groups if everyone isn't fully vaccinated. Health experts concerned as millions of Americans traveled for the Passover and Easter holidays. This is probably the last holiday um, where a vast majority of Americans will remain unvaccinated. But if, you're, if you have unvaccinated people mingling, I do worry about another surge. Doctors fear the spread of contagious variants will increase the country's daily average of cases. That figure has already climbed 20 percent the past two weeks. Officials in suburbs outside Chicago are considering new restrictions amid a sharp rise in cases. But Pennsylvania is relaxing restrictions on many businesses throughout much of the state. Meanwhile, vaccination efforts continue to ramp up. More than four million doses administered on Saturday, a new one day record. This week, at least 14 states are slated to join the 22 already offering vaccination vaccines to anyone over 16. But sadly, the vaccine's coming too late for some families. I have lost my parents to this. I just couldn't help but think if they could have just held out. Since the first doses were administered in December, COVID-19 has killed more than a quarter million Americans. Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. Don't ask why I was up at 3.30 in the morning, but uh, I heard the storms <laughs> roll through last night. And yeah. A lot of lightning and thunder with those. That's why the storms woke you up. Yeah. There <laughs> you go. Nothing to do with candy eggs or anything. No. <laughs> too, much, <laughs> too much sugar. Too much sugar. Oh, I know. A lot of sugar got to be, <laughs> yeah. has to be burnt off this week. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was not, each day this weekend we had some 
early rain, and that did include a few rumbles of thunder. It certainly wasn't all the rain that we needed. It really wasn't too widespread at all. And at the airport today, we didn't even get a tenth of an inch. So if you got a nice downpour this morning, consider yourself lucky. Here's how high temperatures played out. As you know, we held on to a lot of clouds today, uh, more so up in the hill country. That's where high temperatures were below 70 degrees. It only got as warm as 61 in Rock Springs, 74 in Del Rio, 76 here at the airport. Some spots did manage to sneak into the low 80s down a bit closer to the Gulf of Mexico. Here's what's coming your way this week. Another pretty seasonable day tomorrow, but after that we turn up the springtime sizzle mid 80s Tuesday, but we could touch the low 90s by the middle of the week and it will stay unseasonably warm all the way through the end of the upcoming work week, but it's not until the end of the week that we also get to talk about a chance of rain. So we're actually going to start at the end of the week and then come back and then come back to Monday. Uh, I want to mention that chance of rain. Talk about it really briefly. This is something that we're going to be watching closely over the next couple of days, but uh, forecast models have started to hone in on a nice piece of rain making energy coming in late this week through the middle of the week. It's all going to be well off to our north. So anywhere you see this orange or red, that's good rain making energy. That's lift and we need that to produce showers and storms. So through the middle of the week it stays off to our north. That's why we just stay unseasonably warm for much of the week. But by Friday, late Friday into the start of the weekend, a nice swath of this rain making energy starts to move into our part of Texas. So that's why we've got rain chances in the forecast, but not until late this week. For now, it looks like coverage of any showers or storms could be on the lower side. Hopefully we can increase that coverage as our forecast confidence grows. So we'll keep a really close eye on the scenario for you over the coming days. So keep checking the forecast and keep your fingers crossed because even if it's just Friday, a uh, good chance of rain would be very beneficial. 70 now at the airport, cloudy sky, still a good spread between our air temperature and our dew point, so it doesn't feel overly muggy out there. It's 67 now in Gonzales, 72 in Carrizo Springs, so uh, we still have several uh, several spots here that are in the low 70s, but again, dew points are not too high. They're starting to gradually creep up. But for most of us, they're still in the 50s. That is not too bad. It was breezy at times today, and right now we're holding on to a bit of a breeze in San Antonio, also a touch breezy in Catula. Winds tonight should fall off to about 5 to 10 miles per hour, and there are some indications that we could have a little bit of patchy fog early tomorrow morning in places. I'm not overly concerned about any widespread dense fog, uh, but we will bring cloud cover back for everyone for the start of the day tomorrow. So cloudy. Can't roll out some patchy fog early in the morning. Temperatures mid to upper 50s we will shake a lot of the cloud cover by the afternoon. That'll help to push our highs tomorrow into the upper 70s. It'll be breezy again, very comfortable and seasonable on Monday, but it will be getting warmer. Here's Tuesday morning starting off in the low 60s, mostly cloudy. Once we get to Tuesday, we're going to be able to shake those morning clouds a lot faster. That's going to help us to warm up as well. By Tuesday afternoon, we're in the mid 80s here in San Antonio, but we definitely could have some folks off to the southwest in the 90s by Tuesday and then more widespread highs in the low 90s by the middle of the week. So it is going to get toasty out there this week. Those air conditionings will uh, get some pre pre summer warm up here. And again, we're monitoring that chance of some storms Later in the week, we'll, of course, keep you updated. Well, we definitely use our heaters enough, so I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Time to lose the sweaters. Cool weather, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll have a preview of Instant Replay right after this. A national champion has been crowned in the 2021 NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament, played right here in San Antonio in the Alamo Dome. With more of what's on tonight's instant replay, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. You know, and that was just a fun game to watch, I yeah. thought. Came down on the wire. Both teams could have won that game. And Jordan Speed wins his first tournament in three and a half years, and he does it right here in San Antonio. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Williams, a three. You bet. After hosting the entire NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament since mid-March, it all came down to the night's championship game in the Alamo Dome between number one Stanford, number three Arizona, who pulled off the upset of the tournament to get here by stunning number one seed UConn. What a finish as San Antonio's own Kiana Williams and her Stanford teammates take their first title since 1992 by just one point. We'll show you how they did it. And in the state of Texas, Jordan Spieth breaks the winless drought. Wow, Jordan Spieth has not won a PGA Tour 
tournament since 2017. The former Masters U.S. Open and Open champion ended that drought today and did it right here in San Antonio, the TPC Resort Course of the JW Marriott. How did he pull it off against former Texas Open champion Charlie Hoffman? We look there and we will show you. You have to use the timeout to kind of talk it over. McConnell. Yeah. And our San Antonio Spurs historic nine-game homestand comes to a close tomorrow with not much to show for it and coming off back-to-back -back overtime losses before heading out on the road against four, five teams, I should say five teams in just seven days. But first, the Cavs tomorrow night. We'll get you ready for that game as well. All that plus, who wins in NCAA tomorrow? The tournament tomorrow, Baylor or Gonzaga. Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beat if I can talk better. Tonight's game, a classic for the women. Yeah. Tomorrow's could be an instant classic, too. You got that right. All right, thank you, Greg. Sure. Still to come on the night beat, the private information of 32 million Facebook users here in the U.S. and millions more abroad posted to a website by online hackers. Why internet security experts say it poses an, it poses an increased risk for identity theft scams. Plus morale around um, among Capitol Police at an all-time low following another deadly attack. Their police union now turning to Congress for help. These stories and more when the night beat returns. Following Friday's deadly attack at the Capitol, which comes less than three months after the January 6 riots, the Capitol Police Union says morale is low among its officers and is asking lawmakers for help. The union asking lawmakers to ramp up security and with the force uh, understaffed by more than 230 officers right now, the head of the union says Capitol Police are at a breaking point. It's time for Congress to work the plan. We gave them the plan. We need to up our game in support of the Capitol Police. Meanwhile, investigators are continuing to work to piece together the final days of the suspect, 25-year-old Noah Green, who was fatally shot during Friday's incident. His brother telling the Washington Post, Green, quote, slid into deep religiousness and paranoia, end quote, leaving family and friends concerned about his mental state. Cybersecurity experts warn that half a billion Facebook users' information has been posted to a website used by hackers. Those records include full names, locations, email addresses, and phone numbers for 32 million Americans. Facebook claims that this is old data previously reported in 2019 and that the social media company found and fixed the issue at that time. Internet security experts believe the data could still be of value to hackers and cyber criminals who specialize in identity theft. With all of it in one place and easily accessible, experts say consumers should be aware of the risk for more social media scams. President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, says he is certain he'll be cleared of any wrongdoing in the investigation into his business dealings. In an interview with CBS News, he said he's fully cooperating with the Justice Department's investigation into his business dealings in China. The probe is reportedly examining multiple financial issues. That includes whether Hunter Biden and his associates violated tax and money laundering laws in business dealings in foreign countries. In mid-February, Texas was hit with a storm unlike any we've seen in years. As we all undoubtedly remember, that storm left millions of Texans cold and in the dark. Since then, there have been a lot of questions about why the state's power grid was so vulnerable. It's the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. Here's Myra Arthur with a preview. Four minutes, 37 seconds. That's how close Texas was from a catastrophic power grid crash. Such a crash would have left the state in the dark and wiped out cell service for weeks. While we narrowly avoided that situation, the February 2021 winter storm was still devastating. This was a, a total breakdown in Texas infrastructure. Millions of Texans were left without power in frigid temperatures. I'm honestly a firm believer that at this very moment, there are people lying dead inside homes that we still have not discovered. More than 100 people died as a result across the state, many from hypothermia, others trying to keep their families warm, poisoned by carbon monoxide or killed in house fires. Some died when the medical equipment they relied on lost power. My uncle received a treatment three to four times a week and it was then reduced to only twice. Um, due to the weather conditions. Then there's the financial fallout. We will use every other tool in our toolbox 
to work to get this cost down. Texans hit with shockingly high energy bills, some utility companies forced to declare bankruptcy. And while the scope is being assessed, Texans want to know how a winter storm could so severely impact a state that prides itself on its energy production. And everyone waiting to see who, if anyone, will be held responsible. The political reality of a storm doesn't just happen in the days and weeks after the storm, it happens in the months and years after a storm. We're taking a look at just how extraordinary the February winter storm was, what went wrong with our power grid, and how can Texas prevent another disaster like this from happening again? And I know the case that explains team has been working on this episode for a month at least, maybe a little bit more than that. So um, good work there. And uh, looking forward to streaming that case that explains episode. Outside now, but on the warm side, 70 degrees by tomorrow morning. We'll see our temperatures fall into the mid to upper 50s. Clouds build back in tonight. So we started to clear out a little bit late this afternoon, but we will start off on the gray side tomorrow morning into the afternoon. We'll be able to shake some of those clouds. Sunshine will help to warm us up to just shy of 80 degrees. Overall, tomorrow will be a very comfortable day. It's not until Tuesday that we start to crank up the heat just a little bit. We'll talk more about what you can expect in the week ahead coming up in just a bit. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Well, once homeless himself, he's now dedicated his life to helping those who are less fortunate. What's up South Texas is next. Well, he's using his own dark past to create a brighter future for others living in homelessness. 52 year old Lee Edwards is up next on What's Up South Texas. The night team's Jaffney Gray with his story and why he hopes his nonprofit organization inspires those wanting to turn their lives around. We're not going to eradicate homelessness. We're not going to er eradicate hung hunger. But we can make a difference somewhere. Once a month, 52 year old Lee Edwards, his wife, and volunteers with their nonprofit, New Day, New Way, hold a massive feeding for the homeless community. Uh, Lee started the nonprofit four months ago after seeing a tent city downtown. As I see those people, I go back to four years ago where I was one of those people. I was homeless. I know what it's like to have to dig in a trash can. I know what it's like to be spit upon, to be talked bad to, you know. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. It was a phone call from his daughter that turned his life away from the addiction and homelessness he lived for two years. He had to go through something to get where he needed to be and every test has a testimony. Lee's wife, Etoy Edwards, met him as his dark chapter closed. You never know what a person is going through. You don't know that person's story, how they got there. But you always have to remember, everyone is a paycheck away from being homeless. She's overwhelmed with joy seeing his purpose as they feed and serve those in need. They provide hot plates, clothes, toiletries, and even a live band so those in the homeless community can be stress-free for a day. My husband has been where you're at, but he can show you where you can go. Lee is now a homeowner with a great job. He says he feels blessed that he can now pay it forward to others physically, mentally, and spiritually. Maybe one day it just sparks something someone else to want to do something different. The meal is a byproduct of what, the, what my main focus is. For somebody to get one day clean or one day sober, we're trying to change mindsets. We're trying to change attitudes. We're trying to change feelings. For What's Up South Texas, I'm Jaffney Gray. The month of April tends to be a good time for big savings. Some suggestions on where to spend your cash next. Whether it's a car, furniture, or a new pair of shoes, there tends to be a better time to snag a good deal. Discounts on particular goods typically run in cycles. So as we continue to dive into April, 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz says if you're looking to fire up the grill or tackle spring cleaning, now's the best time to buy. <laughs> 
These are the sounds of spring. Consumer Reports tracks prices all year and knows when certain things go on deep discount. So here are some of their top products in April's best time to buy. First up, grills. April is the first time of the year that you'll start to see sales on grills. And a large reason for that is because retailers have this back stock of older models that they need to get rid of to make room for the newer ones. So they discount them. They found this Dynaglow barrel-style charcoal grill for $223 at Walmart and Wayfair. Tester scored it well for even cooking, convenience, and cleanup. Another April sale, lawn mowers. One deal that stands out is the Ego battery-powered mower for $500 at Lowe's. And fall isn't the only time a leaf blower comes in handy. The Ego battery-powered handheld leaf blower is available for $150 at Amazon and Lowe's. It's the time for spring indoor cleaning too, and retailers know it. So to make sure they're the ones getting your business, they're offering deals and discounts. Time for a new vacuum? Consumer Reports likes the Shark Rotator Bagless Upright. It's $250 on Amazon. And if you're upping your curb appeal game, this snapper battery-powered string trimmer is $241 on Amazon and at Home Depot. Just a few ways to clean up without cleaning out your wallet. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Okay, so I'm going to admit something. I've had a lot more candy than one person should have on Easter, oh, not being it. a child. <laughs> and I, it reminds me, Katie, have you yeah. had any peeps today? Because I know that you peeps. demolished some earlier this week, and it made me so happy because I despise them. They, I hate peeps. <laughs> her science experiment. Yes. She like, I did see that. Katie Science Lab, we <laughs> melted peeps. David's here, put them in the microwave for a few seconds. We dissolved them in different liquids. So if you've got some leftover peeps, yeah. you can check that out on kset.com. Don't eat them, destroy them. She asked me what to do <laughs> since she knows I hate them, and I said, blow them up. Blow them up. We didn't exactly she blow didn't. them up. Maybe next year. They um, got puffed up, though. I had a couple. I didn't, my, my tummy didn't feel good afterwards. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Marshmallows a little too much with sugar. Yeah. It's just marshmallow and sugar, man. That so we're is, not on the peep train here. That is it. So maybe some leftover peeps at your house. Also, maybe some oak pollen all over the place, like your car. Uh, if you would like to get your car washed, I can't promise that there won't be more oak pollen on it later this week uh, because we are in the peak here. But as far as rain chances go, we don't have any rain chances until the end of the week. So if you would like to get your car washed tomorrow, Tuesday, wash some of that oak pollen away, uh, you're good to go there. We did have some light showers, uh, rumbles of thunder yesterday morning. Again, this morning, we had a weak disturbance moving overhead. That is moving out. There are some leftover showers well to the south from Laredo to Corpus there. But in our area, things are quiet for now. We did start to clear out a little bit late this evening, uh, but the clouds are going to build back in overnight. It looks like we've got just a few here uh, near 410 and the airport, but we'll see things turn cloudy through the start of the day tomorrow. 57 the morning low up to 76 this afternoon. We'll be pretty close to that again tomorrow afternoon. As far as any rain goes today, those showers and storms that were around very early in the day they only produce six one hundredths of an inch of rain at the airport. So hopefully you were one of the yards that got at least a little bit more than that. 70 now at the airport, 59 in Kerrville, 63 Fredericksburg, 72 in Carrizo Springs. Uh, we've still got a good spread between our air temperatures and our dew points. Our dew points for most of us, with the exception of Beeville, are in the 50s. So with that spread there, it definitely doesn't feel humid. And we're going to keep these numbers in the 50s tomorrow. So it will be another comfortable day on Monday. Winds are calm now from Kerrville up to Fredericksburg. We've got a good breeze from San Antonio all the way down to Catula. Winds are out of the southeast about 5 to 15 miles per hour. Overnight, we'll see them drop to about 5 to 10 miles per hour. And in places where winds really fall off, that could result in a little bit of patchy fog by early tomorrow morning. So that's something to consider. I don't expect it to be too widespread, but can't rule out a little patchy fog early on Monday. Skies will start off on the cloudy side tomorrow morning. As we get into the afternoon past lunchtime, we'll really start to shake a lot of that cloud cover, and that'll help us to warm into the upper 70s, just shy of 80 tomorrow. Another, again, very comfortable day, uh, mainly due to a breeze, 10 to 15 miles per hour after lunchtime tomorrow. Uh, could certainly sneak into the low 80s, even low to mid 80s from places like Carrizo Springs to Catula. 
tomorrow afternoon, but for most of us, things will be fairly comfortable and seasonable on Monday. That will start to change, though, on Tuesday. Our temperatures will really take a, a swing upward by the middle of the week. A lot of us in the low 90s by Wednesday, low to mid 90s possible Thursday. So unseasonably warm a week ahead here. And part of the reason for this is due to the dry line that hangs out in West Texas. It will be on the move this week. So the dry line separates dry air to the west from very humid air to the east. And when this moves in, it can really spike our temperatures. That dry air causes air to heat up more efficiently. So as it starts to move into our part of the state Wednesday, that's when we start to see those afternoon highs jump into the low 90s. Very similar scenario as we get into Thursday. It looks like by Friday that dry line will finally wash off. And then we'll get to introduce a low chance of some showers and storms Friday. So no good rain making energy moving in through the middle of the week. But by late in the week, start of next weekend, this nice swath of red here indicates some nice lift in the atmosphere that could help to produce some showers and storms. Again, that'll be later in the week once we get past that unseasonable uh, warmth that we'll have in place for this upcoming work and school week. We'll keep you updated on those rain chances. We'll uh, have a better idea of how that could play out within the next few days. Yeah, those are some big numbers to see in April. Sorry. Oh, well. Bumming me out. Got to happen sometime. <laughs> Godzilla and Kong duke it out once again on the big screen, but who comes out king of the box office? A look at your holiday weekend numbers next on the night. Tom and Jerry fell to fifth place with $1.4 million as it closed in on a domestic total of $40 million. Six years of searching. Please let this be it. Just over $2 million put Raya and the Last Dragon in fourth place. There's a long dormant piece of me that so very badly wants out. Bob Odenkirk and Nobody went from first to third place on ticket sales of $3.1 million. The religion-themed horror movie The Unholy debuted in second place, taking in $3.2 million. We need Kong. A massive debut for Godzilla vs. Kong. The giant monster matchup dominated the weekend, earning $32.2 million from Friday through Sunday and $48.5 million since it opened on Wednesday, by far the biggest opening since the pandemic began. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Godzilla and Kong, the movie version of the March Madness for Monsters. <laughs> After the shot of the tournament, they kept Gonzaga undefeated. We'll get you ready for the NCAA Tournament Championship game against Baylor. And after tomorrow's final game in this homestand, what lies ahead for our San Antonio Spurs? With more on what's an instant replay, let's head over to Greg Zimmer. Yeah, you know, it's just a tough schedule all the way around. They have 25 games left, 17 on the road. That's probably a good thing, depending on how they play at home, right? And guess who's returning to San Antonio to manage the double-A missions? Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. <laughs> After the shot of the tournament and the game of the year, and maybe the game of all time, the Gonzaga Bulldogs will face the Baylor Bears to decide who will be the national champion in men's college basketball tomorrow. We'll get you ready for that big game. Gives him his chance to show off. White to Rudy. Oh! And after tomorrow, 17 of the Spurs' last 25 games will be on the road, starting with a five-game road trip in just seven days. We'll get you ready for the Spurs' stretch run. And a very familiar face returns to San Antonio to manage the missions again. And when did the Rangers and the Astros host their home openers? All that plus, San Antonio FC releases its schedule. But how many fans will be allowed back at Toyota Field when the season kicks off? We will let you know. Instant Replay is live, and it is next. So it's good to see all these teams coming back together and fans coming back to the games. Mm -hmm. And you have a special guest we haven't seen on IR. In a while. We sure do. A news guy turning sports guy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see him in a little bit. Thanks, you Greg. It. NYC lives. So proclaims Jerry Seinfeld, who recently reopened a popular comedy club for the first time since the pandemic began. Tell me something good is next. 